only be writing about a half a page or maybe a little bit more per experimental, but you've got seven experimentals to report and an abstract for Monday. So if you go in and look, this is in the synthesis and analysis part two, three of that, uh, the instructions there. So it lists the seven compounds that should go into your experimental. You should be writing seven of these. It may feel a little bit redundant as you get further into them, which is a good thing. It means you're actually thinking about what you're putting into your individual experimentals. Most of them are not terribly complicated because it's mostly mix, heat, stir, filter, way. That's pretty much what you did for almost all of your experimentals. A couple of them have a, a few extra steps built into them, but otherwise not too bad. So using the experimentals that you got back uh, earlier in the week that deal with saline and the metal saline uh, syntheses, make sure that you go back and write those individual reports. The thing that's added here on top of that is it's asking you to do some kind of identification, right? So how can you say that you think you made what you think you made? Right. So we have a couple of spectroscopic things that we use to help us get there. We use uh, the Brooker Alpha Infrared Spectrometer. So when we talk about materials and methods and that part that goes into laying the groundwork for your lab report, you always have to make sure you identify unusual equipment or uh, instrumentation you don't have to do this particular experiment relative to others. So the infrared, uh, you always want to uh, identify the unusual equipment by make and model, right? like forward focus or however you think about make and model. Uh, Brooker Alpha Infrared Spectrometer is the infrared you use to collect IR data. The microwave is a biotage initiator. pieces of equipment or instrument and instrumentation that you use over the course of these labs. Otherwise, things like the balances, the stir plates, things like that, those are routine pieces of equipment, glassware, so on, we don't identify. But make sure that those make it into your materials section. You should have one materials section that covers the entire lab report. So when you craft that, that will allow you to condense those things down a little bit. You should also have a reference that covers the entire lab report. So if you have two different documents or three documents that we pulled material from to do the syntheses, compile them into a single reference or series of references at the initial portion of the lab report. One other thing that you need to look out for is to make sure that you have some kind of a descriptive header for each of your individual uh, experiments. So tell me what you're gonna make something along those lines, uh, for each of the individual experimentals so we know what's going on there, right? So just saying part one, part two, part three, part four doesn't get us very far. Make sure you say synthesis of saline or synthesis of copper saline. The other parts you need to look out for, and this is something that people got knocked for in their initial lab reports, is you know what metal you use when you did your syntheses. Don't just say metal saline, metal saline, whatever. Make sure that you are identifying the metal that you actually use. Right? It's not a secret. It's not a surprise. You're not going to ruin it for me. Make sure that you identify those things. Uh, so when it talks about how you know you made what you think you did, uh, infrared spectra will tell you something about whether or not you made what you thought you made because you're looking for those infrared stretches that are identified in the experimentals, right? In the description of the experiment. So for example, when you make KTP, the uh, BH stretch in KTP shows up at about 2436, I think is the number. How many times do you think I've seen that spectrum that I know that it's 2436? The answer is lots. <coughs> so you're looking for that in your KTP synthesis. You're looking for, in your metal TP synthesis, a stretch that is in that 2400 region that has moved. Right? If it shows up at 2436 in both, you're probably looking at the same compound twice. But if it has moved, copper is, I think, at 2474 or something like that. Uh, nickel's at like 2469, something like that. Uh, if it has moved, that's a way to say, you know, in your experimental, infrared data was collected on the product. It showed a, a BH stretch at this location indicating that I made this compound. That kind of stuff. All right. 
this up. Uh, when you did uh, your other compounds, you did some solubility tests. We know something about the fact that some of these should dissolve nicely in organics where others do not. So for example, the ionic stuff like chromium ethylene diamine chloride, right, that guy's an ionic compound. It shouldn't want to dissolve in something like hexane or toluene, but it should dissolve in polar organics or water. Right? It tells you that it's ionic. Right? Solubility rules, remember, from Chem 115, chloride salts are mostly soluble, right? unless you pair them with lead or silver or things like that. So solubility can be something that leads you in that direction. The chromium, manganese, agax, and the metal TP salt, those are all molecular neutral species. They should like to be dissolved in things like acetone or toluene. So solubility there is something that can help you, uh, if you don't have an infrared spectrum, help guide you to say, I think I made what I, what I wanted to because the color is right and my chromium agax dissolved nicely in acetone. So those are all bits and pieces that play towards supporting whether or not you made the compound you wanted. So that's a little bit of a layer on top of what we did in Salin. You should have also tested your Salins. They should all be neutral compounds that dissolve nicely in polar organics. Right? But you also uh, could, if you did infrared, I don't know if you did IR on the Salins, did you? Right? You should be able to then look at this other stretch, right? It talks about the, uh, the in the stretch in your saline, right? So in that back row, back row, you've got that nitrogen, the carbon, right? And then that leads back here to your four leaf drawn benzene ring, whatever. That CN stretch shows up at about 1690, right? Or is it 1590? 1590, right? And it's got a weird kind of, you know, broad, humpy look to it. Your metal saline should show, because I've taken electron density away from this nitrogen by coordinating it to a metal, that in some way those stretches have changed. Right? They're going to move around and they're going to look different. You're going to look at that 1550 to 1650 region and you're going to say, do they look different? Right? Hopefully the answer is yes when you've allowed it to interact with the metal and that helps us to uh, identify the difference. Right? Something has happened. Pretty confident it'd be your product. Might be something weird, who knows, but at least you've made something different. Right? Questions about those ideas of what you can include in that section that talks about identification. Go. So you said you do kind of like a subheading for each experimental? You should have for every experimental a header that says something about what you're doing in that section. When we get to the larger lab report later in the term, it might be spectroscopic identification of blank. Here it's probably going to be synthesis of something. Right? You can be a little more creative if you want, but you don't want to be so creative that I have to start looking up words in the dictionary. With my limited science uh, encyclopedia and dictionary. Right. With the uh, products that we did not get an IR with, you still just want us to describe the solubility? And solubility and, and or color changes okay. are probably what you're looking for there. Some, okay. of the, uh, some of the individual experimental descriptions, how you did the lab, right, actually will tell you what the color of the product should be. Mm -hmm. So in some of those cases, you can do that. And you can say, yes, I made chromium ethylene diamine chloride because it turned yellow. I got a yellow product at the end. Right, those kinds of things. Have two soluble on water and one soluble on hexane. I don't need to tell me what you got. Right. But you can, based on the formulation and the charges, figure out which things probably should dissolve in water and which things probably won't. The ionic stuff should dissolve in water. Right. Other questions? All right. Many of you probably have not looked very closely at the Salem lab that you've gotten back. So what I want to point to before you go too far into writing your experimentals is if you come back up here at the very top, here is my snarky Salem lab notes comment for when I graded those lab reports uh, that has a lot of things that people did that I marked and maybe if you did them a lot, I stopped marking them eventually because of you know, beating the dead horse eventually. It's hard to do, but things that you can look at, and you'll notice several pages of stuff that may or may not apply to every lab report, but apply to several lab reports, so it might be yours. Things to look at here, 
um, that might help you as you write those other things. So for example, I just happen to have this on the try to avoid talking about things you didn't do. Right? So in the lab instructions, if it said, if the solvent level drops below 10 milliliters, add methanol to make sure you stay above 10 milliliters. If you didn't add any methanol, don't talk about it. If you didn't do it, it's really not relevant to your individual experiment. Right? Or if it says something along the lines of, if this catches fire, don't put water on it. If your stuff didn't put, catch fire, don't talk about putting water on it. Does that make sense? So stick to the things that you actually did. Right? And that's the message that goes with that part. But there are lots of little bits and pieces that as I was grading them, I made an extra entry on the thing that said, think about this, think about this, think about this. That may or may not come up as you're writing All right. Questions about any of that? We feel only just partially equipped so that by the time you get to Sunday night, you're going to be going, what the hell am I doing? Is that what we're doing? It shouldn't be that bad because the experimentals themselves are relatively short with not a lot of manipulations, right? It's not like the organic lab where you mix the stuff, you either you put on the weird condenser, you move it over here, and then you ran it down column, and you did this, that, and the other thing, right? Most of these are just two to three steps in the disease. And in the end, it may feel formulaic as you're writing them, but I would discourage you from just saying, I'm gonna cut this experimental and change the species here, and I'm gonna cut this one and, and paste it and do it here. Because if you make the same mistake repeatedly over and over and over again, that doesn't work well. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I want to point out is, is moles and sig figs. Uh, one of the things that we saw quite a bit um, is that people didn't report moles for reagents and products. Right? It is good form to report grams and moles. Whatever your measured quantity was at the end of your experiment, whether it's a volume, a mass, whatever, to report that thing and then give it in moles because that allows the reader to immediately go back and look at your reagents, which you should be reporting in moles, and do some quick math to figure those things out. Any individual calculations should go into the supporting materials. You don't do the calculations in the experimental itself. Your spectra, right, your infrared spectra, should be attached to the end of the lab report as supporting documentation as well. You do not have to. All you have to do is, is just say that it's in the supporting information or just attach them and I'll go looking for them. Right? Uh, I'm trying to think of what else there is to talk about here. I don't know, I'll think about 100 things after we walk out of the room. Questions? Go ahead. Uh, when we report moles, you want that from the grams that we were like sp supposed to measure, I guess, or what we always, actually? You're always talking from the quantities that you actually use okay. in the laboratory. Okay. Right? Um, I had a note that the formula of chemical work is that. At the, somewhere in your description, you should be identifying, somewhere in the, in the grand scheme of things, if you have a large lab report that includes all the parts, somewhere you're going to talk about the formula of what your stuff was. Right? When you say that, uh, I ended up with 0.51 grams of saline, right? Remember, salines are a class of compounds, right? And there could be any number of different salines that you could have made. You should tell me which one you made, so I should just need to place somewhere. Somewhere in that experimental, the easiest way to do it is to put it in the title and just say synthesis of a saline, comma, C16H16N2O2, or something like that, right? Or synthesis of uh, copper TP2 or something like that, so that I have some idea of what you actually made. Right? Oh, uh, making sure that your sig figs match as you work through. Masses are almost always three sig figs because most of us use top loading balances for the individual measurements that we took, which means that if you report four sig figs in the percent yields, that you are out of line. You should be only having three. Um, in the Salem lab where we measured using the volumetric pipetters, right, those actually go to 0. 0.4000 digits, right, instead of 0. 0.4 or 0.2. And remember that in that first lab experiment when you did the Salem, salicyl aldehydes eliminate react, not up to the other. So your theoretical yield is about 0. 0.52 grams, not about 0. Anything else? Otherwise.
otherwise, most of the experiments are laid out to have something in gross excess and something limiting. Chromium chloride is almost always a limiting reactant in your chromium reactions, right? Otherwise, we add a gross excess of the uh, uh, pentane diamond to that to make the act act. We add a gross excess of the ethylene diamond to make the ethylene diamond complexes. But the metal is almost always your limiting reactant. Other questions? How many people actually got something when they did the manganese act besides the brown filter? That's one of the weirdest, it's like an organic synthesis. You know, you go in organic chemistry, you run a reaction, you follow all the, all the experimental details almost perfectly, and you still get nothing at the end sometimes. This is one of those kinds of syntheses. Where you'll walk into the room, if I were to walk into the room and there were 10 of you doing the experiment, there would be four people who get nothing on their filter paper, four people who get a couple of crystals, and one or two people would be like, hey, look, I got half a vial. Because it's just that weird and that variable. Right? That one has a weird balanced chemical equation for uh, determining percent yield at the end. Uh, but uh, what you should keep in mind is that when that reaction is done, you put in an excess of permanganate, right? Because it tells you to like one or two sig figs, hey, measure this much permanganate, dump it in there. Go measure some more, put that in there. It's the manganese two chloride that is the limiting reaction in that case. All right, I'm just stream of consciousness thinking, thinking right now. Anything else that needs to be addressed? Are we good with at least attacking this somewhat? It takes about half an hour to write this curve is what I would say. And I, I encourage you to double space it so I have plenty of room to make comments. But it takes about half an hour. You do a couple of this afternoon, do a couple tomorrow, do a couple on Sunday, revise it, boom, you're done. Right? Abstract should be 10 sentences or less, right? Should include right, the key features of the lab that you're talking about. So what should be in the lab abstract? You need to tell me what you were going to make. Right? In, this, in this experiment, I made these seven compounds. Boom, 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 boom. Right? What are the key results? Percent yields. Right? So you could condense that into I made saline X percent yield, uh, copper saline X percent yield, and so on. So there are ways to condense these so that you have an economy of sentences. There should be more sentences here than you need. Right? Other key findings include solubility. These compounds were soluble in water, these were soluble in acetone, these were soluble in polyphenol. Right? Uh, <clears throat> these compounds exhibited boron hydrogen stretches at 24 something and 24 something. These had CN stretches at something and something. Right? <clears throat> those are the key findings of your lab. Right? So making sure that those things end up in there, crafted into a short paragraph that articulates the key idea of the lab. Right? So always remember when you write an abstract, put in there what you were asked. At this particular stage, the purpose of the lab was to synthesize a series of, a series of different transition metal complexes with chelating ligands right, to determine their properties and for later use in spectroscopic analysis. seeing delta G in organic chemistry and the organic chemistry books. 
<clears throat> these are the things that we're going to be talking about. But the whole point is trying to figure out how we can nail down whether or not a reaction happens all by itself. Right? That's where we're trying to go. Why do we talk about enthalpy? Enthalpy is frequently associated with heat, right? which is where we started last time. Enthalpy, that whole idea of releasing heat to the surroundings, must be a good thing. Because when we think of reactions that happen all by themselves, boom, right? we think about heat being released in large quantities. Turns out that's not going to be the answer, but it leads us in the right direction. Entropy is this idea of disorder, right? the whole idea that everything is naturally falling apart. Second law of thermodynamics. First law tells us that energy moves from one place to another um, and is conserved. The second thing tells us reactions happen when I can increase the entropy, but entropy all by itself is not a simple enough concept to be able to quantify it. So that's what we'll be talking about early next week. Next week's lab is probably my favorite lab of the whole term, uh, but it almost always turns out to be the lab that students despise the most. Uh, this is the borax lab, and it's not my favorite just because we work with boron, the coolest element ever. Uh, but it's my favorite lab because you're going to determine actual meaningful thermodynamic quantities from doing a simple titration or two. So you can do really simple experiments and get meaningful thermodynamic data you know, that are of the sort that you just look up in weird tables somewhere and on online otherwise. You can generate that on your own. Right? So it's kind of a fun, cool lab, lab that, you, that you do, and it's not a terribly long lab report either, so people like that part. Right? Um, so we're going to be introducing those ideas because you're going to be determining enthalpy and entropy for a reaction uh, by uh, doing a titration. Actually, it's a couple titrations. It's chemistry. You can't just do one titration at a time. It's like M&M. Just whoever eats just one M&M &M and then closes the bag and puts it away. No one. you got to have a few at a time, right? OK, so we're starting with enthalpy. Explosive loss of heat often accompanies uh, what we think of as spontaneous processes. The whole point here being that that's not the answer all by itself. right? So when we think about enthalpy, we think of heat of reaction. It's this idea that if I have reactants going products, if energy is released, we can think of that as being uh, like our coffee cup, slowly cooling and releasing energy to the surroundings. Right? The whole point of what we did on Wednesday was setting us up to that point where we're talking about how energy changes go with reactions. A reaction can be thought of as a system all to itself. Right? And we can think of it as being a situation where my system has an excess of energy at the beginning and it gives it away to the surroundings in what we would call an exothermic reaction. Energy being released to the surroundings. The same idea as a hot coffee cup going to a cold coffee cup. And as we think about the change in enthalpy, right, that change in enthalpy is categorizing the energies that are being released or gained by a reaction system. Right? As we categorize that, we always talk about the change in enthalpy. And the reason why we talk about the change in enthalpy is that enthalpy encompasses so many things and so many ideas that we don't really know what zero enthalpy is. The people who have had me for Chem 115 have heard this before. We don't know what zero enthalpy really means. Since enthalpy includes things like the energy stored in bonds, vibrational energy, translational energy, solvation, all these different ideas, we're never completely independent of those. So we really don't know what zero enthalpy looks like. But we do know how to measure the difference between two points. We can do that and approximate it by measuring temperature changes over those two things and say, if I had this much kinetic energy in my stuff at this temperature when I started and this much at the end, then I must have lost this much energy. There's my change. Right? So that whole idea of delta H, the change in enthalpy being negative, says I'm going from a place where I had a lot of energy in the form of enthalpy, all the things it measures, to a place where I had less. Right? So what does that look like? It says that my reactants, if my scale of enthalpy is here, my reactants have to be here, and my products were down here somewhere. That's all that means, right? That's where most of us stopped when we got to 
uh, energy and enthalpy at chem 115. This idea that we can start talking about enthalpy instead of temperature for chemical reactions because sticking a, a thermometer into a molecule or a reaction is not always easy. Likewise, if I have a chemical process that goes the other way, or I have to put energy in to get my reactants to go to products, that's an endothermic process, energy goes in, and my delta H is greater than zero. Or the way to think about it is, if I look at the scale of energy here, here are my reactants, here are my products. And my delta H represents the difference between those two states. Question. So essentially what it says is reactants are here. In order for this to be equal to that, I need this energy plus my delta H to make these two level. And same thing on the other side. All right. How many people remember talking about state functions? Basically, state functions allow us to do this. We go to great lengths to try to reduce what we're doing to state functions because then we don't have to measure or think about how we do the process. We can just measure beginning and end point and we're going to go. So the key idea behind these state functions are right, that they are only dependent upon initial and final states. Right? So like I said, I can measure the temperature before and after, and that tells me how much energy, through a couple of calculations, was lost by my reaction. Right? So that's not too bad. Right? That idea, that's what we've been doing all along. We've kind of been cheating that way without actually defining it that way. But that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to reduce things to state functions. It's size dependent, right? So if we think about it in terms of the amount of energy that it takes to melt a block of ice, if my block is 10 times larger, it should make sense that my amount of energy should be 10 times bigger, right? So they scale is what that tells you. Right? And finally, they are additive, meaning that if I take my block of ice and melt it and then add enough energy to boil it, I can take those energies, add them together, and get the total energy of the process that I just did. All of these are things that we've been exploiting as we go along through organic and other places, but maybe have not talked about in that way since Chem 115. So it gets us back to that point where we finished in Chem 115. All right. The easiest way, and what I gave you on this sheet was <clears throat> some problems laid out so that I actually gave you some place to write, because I know not everybody has places to write on how they're doing their record keeping for the course. Uh, so it's my way to say, if you're going to do these problems, you're going to like it in it uh, as you're working through it. <clears throat> Phase changes are the easiest play to think about this kind of stuff because it becomes relatively straightforward to think about this idea of what happens as I go from one form of matter to another. So for example, if I have water, solid, I know that if I add energy to it, my solid water is going to do what? It's going to, well, my solid water's going to do what first? It's going to melt. So I'm going to get this phase change that allows us to go from one form or another to another, right? Likewise, if I take my liquid water and I cool it down, right? Cool it down meaning take energy away from it. If I go the opposite direction, I can turn that water back into solid ice. What do I know about those two things? My directionality of it is going to tell me what the, the sign, of my, uh, sign of my process is. If I'm melting ice, my energy has to be a react and endothermic. But if I am freezing water, I'm writing this reaction backwards, plus whatever energy it takes, exothermic. I have to rob the water of its kinetic energy to slow the particles down enough so that they stick together and solidify. Right? Phase changes are all about whether or not we're trying to take molecules away from each other and make them more free to move around, or whether we're allowing them to start sticking together and forming more condensed phases. So as we look at this whole idea, we can think about phase changes in their simplest forms. 
And we can say something like, if I were to look at, as I again, as I look through their chart, here we go. If I look at my different phases of matter that we're used to running into, keeping in mind that if you're on any of these science listservs, which everybody is, right? <clears throat> it seems like every other week they're saying scientists in Norway have discovered the 50th different phase of matter. And it's like, yeah, maybe, but you have to be like on the surface of Jupiter for that to be true, right? Uh, these are the ones that we care about. Go ahead, Bob. Um, why is the error not bi directional? Because in this case, we are defining a process that's telling us that we're going in this particular direction, right? It's not bi directional because we're not actually establishing the equilibrium. That comes next, right? So we're laying the groundwork energetically for one way reactions for now. Then we're going to come back after the break and we're going to start saying, all right, what happens when I have reactions that go both directions? And how do I deal with that? Right? So that's coming in. So you're getting ahead of it. Double board eyes. OK. So for example, this idea of a solid turning a liquid into a liquid, what do we call that phase two? Melting. Melting. And a liquid going to a solid is freezing. freezing right? Those are the terms we use in our everyday vernacular. Scientifically, we call that fusion. So when we talk about thermodynamic quantities, this process right here, this delta H, is actually the energy of fusion for water. In this direction, endothermic, it has a value that's positive. In this direction, it's negative. But what do I know about the size of that energy value? Based on this graph, going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, that delta H is, is exactly the same size, right? So it's either positive if I'm melting or negative if I'm freezing my stuff. But it is the same size. And that's what the state function tells us. If I have two different energy states, all it's saying is that my products are equal to the reactants plus this. Or if I have this exothermic process, it's telling me that my reactants, or my products minus this amount of stuff, are equal to my reactants. Or that for my solid to be equal to a liquid here, I have to add that much energy. However you want to think about it. But the whole idea behind the state functions is that never, it doesn't matter which direction you go, the energy gap is the same size. So I can actually flip these reactions over and I can relate these values to one another. Right? Here, my value is this much energy on the positive side. Here, it's this much energy on the negative side, right? going in the opposite direction. All right, so delta H of fusion is what's typically reported uh, for something like water. Walking away from the chalk. For something like water, delta H of fusion is about 6.0 kilojoules per mole of water. So that's super big, right? that's super small. Relative to other materials, uh, it is actually relatively large. So things like hydrocarbons have a much smaller delta H of fusion. It takes less energy to melt the hydrocarbon than it does to melt water. If I take a liquid and turn it into a gas, what do we call that process? Evaporation. That's evaporation. A gas turning into a liquid is condensation. Typically, this is reported as vaporization or delta H vapor is what we run into here. For water, that number is actually really, really big. To take liquid water and turn it into gaseous water vapor. We have to put a lot of energy into a sample that has molecules that stick pretty close together. Hydrogen bonding, strong intermolecular forces, right? So for water, that delta H of vaporization is huge. It's about 40 something, it's on your sheet, about 40 something kilojoules per mole. Right? On the positive side, right? To go from liquid to solid. Which means, or liquid to uh, gas, for the gas to go back to the liquid, it's negative 44. Right? What you'll notice very frequently is, just before it snows, if you're standing outside, all of a sudden it'll start to get a little bit warmer. 
just as it starts to snow. Because there are two things going on. One, the water vapor in the air is rapidly going from gas to liquid to solid. All of these, gas to liquid, exothermic, liquid to solid, exothermic, in order to make snow, you've got to release all that energy to the surroundings. The air temperature actually goes up a degree or two right as it starts to snow, typically, because of that. Something that you can actually observe. So if you all go outside and stand outside for like four days straight, whenever it starts to flurry next, you'll be ready to notice the temperature change, right? Okay, last one is one that we don't think of nearly so much. A solid going directly to a gas is what? A sublimation. And a gas going directly to a solid is? Deposition. Deposition. Typically here, we just stick with delta H sub for sublimation and roll with that value. We're gonna see in a few minutes that because delta H's enthalpies are additive, we can actually, because we know delta H vape and delta H fuse, we can actually calculate delta H sub. Because it's additive, right? Okay. Questions about this, just to think about phase changes. So the reason why we start with phase changes is they're easy to visualize. Right? And we already intuitively know where the energy has to be. Right? When we get into actual chemical reactions, we don't always know where the energy has to be in those equations. Right? But once we do, we don't want to treat it. So this is where we're going to start. Right? So the first problem is asking you, and, and really it's also saying, let's think about moles and quantities again. The first question is asking you to calculate the change in enthalpy when I condense 2.4 moles of water vapor, here's the energetic value. So what it's saying is I'm going to take H2O liquid, turn that into H2O condensation gas, turn that into H2O liquid, and delta H for this process is 44, positive 44 kilojoules per mole, assuming it's the product, right, or the reactive product. In this case, am I giving away energy or am I making energy? Giving away energy. So my delta H is talking about an energy that's over here, right? Or it's saying, I am going from here to here. If my energy is over here, is my energy value positive or negative? Negative. So my delta H is actually Negative 44 kilojoules per mole. So how do we report this? Delta H of vaporization is usually recorded in the positive direction. That's how it's given. Right? You actually have to interpret from that where the sign is. Right? So in this case, what we're saying is I have liquid water here, I have gaseous water here, I'm going in this direction. What's the sign of delta H? It's negative. So anytime the energy is showing up on the product side, you have to pay attention to the number and see whether the sign goes with exothermic. Questions about that? Exothermic process, my delta H must be of negative value. Right. Otherwise, this looks just like a unit conversion problem that you are used to encountering somewhere else. The key idea is since energy is part of our balanced equation, I can go back and forth between any of my different chemical species and energetic species directly just by using the value of the energy. And how the equation is written is important. We'll get back to that in a little bit. So this says for every mole of water, I'm going to release 44 kilojoules of energy. Moles go away. And the question is, what is my energy change for that reaction, for that process? Negative 100. What's that? I think it's a negative 100. Should be somewhere around negative 100, right? 110. All right. Two sig figs here. That zero really isn't significant, right? So 110 is good. Or negative 1.1 times 10 to the second would work as well. 
some people in the room after a year of organic and spending this whole first portion of the course talking about molecules and structures and things like that are going, hey, I'm going to be end of the second. 1.1 times negative 1.1. All right. Second problem says, think about the energy change that we're talking about with regard to a block of ice. Right? So in this case, my solid is down here somewhere. All right. This guy is 44 kilojoules per mole. This guy is six. Second problem says uh, I've got 6.0 kilojoules per mole of water. I'm going to take ice and I'm going to absorb H2O solid going to H2O liquid. I'm going to absorb about 112 kilojoules. So about the same amount of energy as what we had over here that was released. And it asks, how much ice can I melt with that quantity of energy? So in this case, I'm going to be taking solid water, turning it into liquid ice. Am I going in the positive direction or the negative direction? Positive, right? So my energy is a reactant. Its value is going to be positive. All right. In this case, that's the only measured value I have. I have a conversion factor, right? I got 6.0 kilojoules per mole. That's maybe not the best starting point for a calculation. You almost want to start with some measured value or unique number, right? But in this case, we're going to do the same kind of conversion. I know that. How many kilojoules do I need to, or to uh, melt uh, a mole of ice? 6.0, right? Positive 6.0. My question is, if I stop here, do I, am I reporting an answer that is what's being asked? No, what do I have to have? I have that gram. It's a molar mass of water. What's that? Let me see. Water weighs what? Per mole? About 1802. So how many grams of water can I melt with about 112 kilojoules? I'm limited by two sig figs in the bottom of my calculation. Question. All right. When we were back here under state functions, it said the nice thing about delta H the state function is that state functions are additive. Meaning that if I can string a bunch of these processes together that are related to one another, I can just start combining enthalpy values. Right? It becomes a pretty useful tool when we start doing some complex calculations. Right? But the whole idea is, it says, because these two functions are state functions, I know that going from the solid directly to the gas, delta H or sublimation, is just combining those two individual processes together. Does it make sense? Or we can see that since sublimation, solid to gas, should be the same as solid to liquid, liquid to gas, right? that I can calculate or approximate delta H of sublimation here. Right? What should it be? If you can do the finger math here, right? It's about 50 kilojoules. that up if you want to. 
pictorially that makes sense. I hope. Yes. What does that look like in terms of chemical processes? Well, if I take my individual reactions, what it says is I want to take a solid and turn it into a liquid. Right? I'm going to take H2O solid and go to H2O. And then I'm going to take H2O liquid and turn it into H2O gas. In essence, what we're just doing is taking these two chemical processes because our energetic values are delta H's and they're additive, and I'm going to add the two reactions together. H2O solid plus H2O liquid gives us H2O liquid plus H2O gas. All right? Well, that's not necessarily what I was looking for. That doesn't look like sublimation, solid gas. But there's something I can do to simplify that expression. What can I do? Right. Essentially, what we learned in Chem 115 when we did net ionic equations and such was anything that looks exactly the same on both sides of the equation is what we call a what? It starts with S. A spectator, right? It's not part of the process. So I can cancel them out. There's delta H in sublimation. So the idea is that since they're additive, I can take the energy change, delta H of this first part, I'll call that delta H of reaction one, is solid to liquid. That was positive 6.0 kilojoules per mole. Delta H for my second part, my second reaction, was positive 44 kilojoules per mole. I get delta H sublimation plus H. All I have done here is said I'm taking this picture, which I think everybody can look at and say, I see exactly what you did, and express it in terms of the actual chemical processes. This one and this one being additive to give me that last one right there. Okay. How many people have heard of Hess's Law? We're going to spend a little bit of time, uh, probably on Monday, it's actually on the back of your sheet. Uh, a little bit of time on Monday, probably, working on Hess's Law. That's what this is. We've actually now done Hess's Law without calling it that, which I guess it just... Question. This is the power of state functions, right? And whereas you're looking at this and you're saying, this isn't going to help you to stop an arterial bleed at some point 10 years down the road, Right? It's going to help to get you into med school. So yes, it will. Question. All right. This is where we end up spending the last bits of our time in Chemo 15. Maybe we talked about phase changes, but we ended up in this idea of saying, I'm going to take this delta H now and extend it to things that are less intuitive. For example, I'm giving you an equation here. Sulfur dioxide reacts with oxygen gas and becomes SO3, sulfur trioxide. You can look at that and you can say, I have no idea which side of that equation is higher or lower in energy. But if someone else has measured it, they can report it for you. Right? In this case, it says delta H of reaction is negative 186 kilojoules for that reaction right there. Right? Is energy a product or is energy a reactant? It's a product, right? If it's being if it's a negative sign, it tells you that that reaction is written in such a way that SO2 and oxygen are here, just like gaseous water. <coughs> and SO3 is down here, just like liquid water. Right? And if energy is being given away, it tells you that in order for the products to equal my reactants, I have to put all those things together to get there. Negative sign means energy is a product. Right? So it tells me my reactants are higher in energy than my products. What it's asking you to do is say, write a thermochemical reaction for this. Right? This is where we start to break the rules a little bit. Because in thermodynamics, one of the things that we learned early on, or that we were told early on, that you may or may not remember, is that a state function is size dependent. Right? 
We did this a little bit with the ice, right? A big block of ice requires a lot of heat to melt it, right? A small block of ice requires a proportionately less or smaller amount, right? The size of the thing that we're studying matters. In this case, I've written, oops, on that, a chemical equation that looks like this. In thermochemical equations, all you have to do is have the things balanced. It doesn't matter if you have fractions in your equations. So what it says is, if I rewrite a thermochemical equation for this so that I'm talking about one mole of SO2, what do I have to do to the coefficient in front of SO2 to go from two moles to one? I have to take half of it. In essence, what it's saying is, take this equation, and cut it in half. If my equation is cut in half, what's going to happen to my energy change? I'm going to cut it in half. They're proportional. So my delta H is now one half of its original value. What does my thermochemical equation look like? Well, if I distribute my one half throughout this equation, I'm now going to have one mole of SO2 reacting with half a mole of oxygen. giving me one mole of SO3, and then my delta H for that reaction is going to be negative 186 kilojoules over 2. Negative H. Everything scales. That's what that whole part of, that we just did is there to tell you. Everything that we do scales in thermodynamic processes. And so you can write the equation in different ways, and it's still true as long as you treat the energy the same way you treat the equation. We're used to writing equations this way, right? One of the rules that we're taught is that when we write a balanced chemical equation, we clear our fractions when we're done, right? Or the other way to think about it is sometimes when we balance chemical equations that look like this, and we say, how do I get this to work? Oh, I need half an oxygen. And then I'll multiply by two and I get this. Maybe that's how you would balance something that looks like this, right? Depends on how you've been taught to do it. This is a valid place to stop in thermodynamics. Right? And so what it tells you is you have to pay attention to the reaction and you know, how that relates to the amount of energy that you are using in that process. It also tells you that you can scale just based on the balance equation. I could have multiplied the first one by two, and then I would have multiplied delta H by two, for example. Questions? It's size dependent. Everything scales. Good with that so far. All right, the last one is a good one just because it gets us back to thinking about balanced equations and energetic values and grams and moles and all that good stuff again, <coughs> instead of just phase changes. The last one says that we're going to burn some methane and make water and CO2, right? Well, what's methane? CH4. CH4 is going to react with O2 to make CO2 and is it the same kind of water? Let's just presume that. Right? Turns out it's going to matter, right? There's more kinetic energy in gaseous water than there is in liquid water. So phase symbols become more important. Right? And it says delta H for the reaction or for burning one mole of methane is negative 802 kilojoules. So my energy is what's here? Why are we assuming methane is gas? Hmm? Why are we assuming methane is gas? Uh, well, it is a gas under normal conditions. We're going to define standard conditions on that. Is that equation balanced? How do I balance it? Put it two in front of the oxygen and two in front of the water. All right. What we're told is that one mole 
of CH4 is the equivalent of releasing 802 kilojoules of energy. Right? My energetic value for that reaction on the product side, negative, goes with one mole. Does that thermodynamic equation match my energetic value? Meaning, how does this number relate to this equation that's written? Is it exactly right? Is it twice as big as it should be? Is it half as big as it should be? What's that? Correct. I've got a one over here, right? And my information tells me that one mole of methane makes 802 kilojoules. Right? So are those two on the same scale? Yes. That actually simplifies what we do because you don't have to stop and look at it and say, are those things the same or not? With our phase changes, they were the same. We didn't need mole conversions to get to where we were going. Right. But the whole idea is you gotta look out for more relationships. All right, so it says, uh, if I burn 50 grams of methane, how much energy do I release? Right, what's the energy change, which means I have to have my sign. So in order to be able to get into my balanced chemical equation to get to energy, what do I have to do to my 50 grams of methane? Turn it in moles, all right? So what's the molar mass of methane? 16.04 grams of methane per one mole. That's a conversion factor, right? It says delta H of reaction is negative 802 kilojoules for every one mole of methane. So now I can cancel methane and get to energy. Right? So this guy goes down here. Energy goes here. What is my energy change for 50 grams of methane? Negative 2,500. Negative 2,500? For the math people right now, you're going, <sighs> because this is so much better than looking at all those transition metal complexes and stuff like that. If you're the organic -y person, you're going, I wish we had more transition metal complexes to look at. Okay. But we spend the next not until we get to the last week or two of the term in very math relationship type stuff. So this is the math portion of the course. Keeping in mind, you need that copy of your Gilbert text, the one with the red binding from 1015. As I said, you have to wait behind the spirit rock out here and ambush a first year nursing student as they leave 1015 this morning. They should be just finishing up right now. Um, you need to ambush them to steal their textbook. Right. Make sure that you have one to work from for the near future. Question. Does this seem familiar? At least with regard to what you get at the very end of thermal and thermal. Alright, good. Because we're going to blow this all up on the Did you right. say that? Mm -hmm. Remember your hand was put in the 